One of the things I learned a long time ago, and I'm always relearning it, was that just because you see a need doesn't mean you're the one to meet it. Now, I say that I learned it a long time ago. The truth is, I'm always relearning it. God has a plan and a purpose and a design to cause things to happen circumstantially in a lot of people's lives for different reasons. We know that the scriptures are always true. Whatsoever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. It even starts off with God is not mocked. So a lot of times when you find yourself dealing with other people, especially either in relationships or in your fellowship or your church or your community environment or some just any other place that you might be you don't always know all the facts you don't always get the whole story I know in a lot of churches you know I, I have attended and seen and you kind of get a gist of some of the things that are going on but most of the time it's really not that important and one of the things you find out about God is that Though he is the one who is changing and walks in the midst of the seven candlesticks, you know, and takes care of all the different churches and different people at different times, we're not called really to be that consumed with each other about fixing each other as we are about learning to walk with our God. So you see, it's not so much about doing as it is about being, because everyone wants to do-do on someone. You know, you want to go out and give somebody a word. You want to go over and tell somebody something. You know, you want to pray for them, lay hands on them, or lead them to the Lord, or disciple them, or teach them, or do something to them. You want to, what I say is, do to them. Because you want to do to them what you do with yourself sometimes, or you have done, or somebody has done to you. That's not always a good thing. Sometimes do do is do do. <laughs> and trying to do something, if God didn't tell you to do it, it's not such a good thing. <laughs> so, I've had to learn the hard way for myself that just because somebody has a need doesn't mean that, you know, I... Well, I should say it two ways. Just because somebody doesn't meet, has a need doesn't mean that I have to meet that need. Or, just because somebody has a need doesn't mean that I have to tell them the answer to their need. Sometimes God wants you to just shut up and be still. And let Him work in that person's life. More often than not, I found if we do, like I said, the, the shortcut, it's always for me a Christian shortcut. It's the shortest way to get to heaven. It's the easiest way to grow up as a Christian. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I use it in the back of my mind. I think of it every time that I have to go anywhere, do anything, say anything, be anything, think anything, or even react to anything. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not in thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. It's not the shield of faith and all these other things. It's actually an action derivative that's telling you to do something in quite a few different parts. The first part being to trust in the Lord. And, you know, it adds the extra part that says, you know, lean not in thine own understanding. It's pretty quick, you know, meet, hit you between the action phases, you know, of your life, you know, between the eyes saying, no, don't do it. Meaning, I'm the one you trust in. So if you're you're doing anything else outside of, you know, like really, how do you get to the place of trust? You ask him, James 1, 5, whatever. But the point is, is that in order to trust, you know, and he tells you, lean on, I know understanding in all the ways of knowledge, you've direct your path. you got to communicate in order to trust. You can't just belligerently trust. That's just blind faith. And we're not given blind faith. We're given intelligent, rational, reasoning minds that says, yes, faith is a gift. And it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen, which means that we can appropriate faith because it says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So we're supposed to think through these things so that we be not transformed, we be not like conformed to the world, but we be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might prove what is perfect and acceptable will of God in Christ Jesus, which is to not trust in our own understanding, but to lean in his way of doing things and to trust in him with all our heart so that we are not caught in our own understanding and that we would acknowledge him and that he could direct our path and that he would whisper in our ear and he would say in our heart and he would tell us which way to go and do all those things. Having said all that, what do you do? You do-do. 
just like me. You know, somebody comes up to you and says, no, I hate those people, you know, and you, they're just venting, you know, but you go off and say, no, you can't hate, brother, you know, hating is of the devil, and, you know, blah, 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 you're of the flesh, you know, you're copping out, and you're quitting, you know, you know. And that guy says, oh, thank you, you know, little did you know I was flushing out, and I just needed somebody to listen so I could vent, but, you know, I appreciate all your perspective, you know, glad you got me there, you know, glad I didn't already know that. The hardest part of being a Christian when you're older is knowing when to be like John the Baptist. Shut up, sit down, back off, and let it go. In other words, let God reveal himself. Let the circumstances reveal themselves. When you're young, it may be easier to get involved and do the wrong thing over and over again to learn the right thing. But you know, when you get older, really it comes a time when you just step back and you watch more than you get involved. Recently I had an experience where, you know, I've been seeing on a consistent basis and I don't know how it'll all work out because God hasn't given me a word, although I got really close to getting involved, you know, so I get really close, somebody tells me they, they have something going and I want to get involved, you know, I want to go do that. Oh, you know, you got an outreach to New Zealand, I want to go there. Oh, you need... You need uh, ushers? Oh, I want to do that. Oh, you mean you need uh, uh, Sunday school teachers? Hey, you know, right up their alley. <laughs> Trust me, I don't want to do Sunday school teaching. <laughs> I've been there, done that, no way. <laughs> them little brats running around? I'm kidding. They're not little brats. But boy, some of them adults, they're big brats. You watch them kids come in, you know, that are picking up their kids? Man, I wonder, you know, I got mercy for those kids because guess what? The adults are usually the ones that are the bigger brats. The little kids are like saints compared to some of the adults I've seen. <laughs> but thank God they're dropping them off to Sunday school to get something, you know. I don't know what the adults are getting, but God knows I know that Sunday school is probably right on. So, I see needs, you know, and I jumped in lots of times doing the things that needed to be done until someone else would fill in, you know. And God has always blessed it. But, you know, it's not always the best thing to do. And it's not always the right thing to do. I've just done it anyways. And sometimes that's not really good for you when you get older. When you get older, you learn that there is something better about watching someone else step into someone's shoes and fill the gap, so to speak, stand in the space that God intended for them to be so they could grow into the fullness of what they were meant to be. And I look at a tomato plant, you know, and I, I raise these tomato plants because, frankly, I want to get tomatoes. I want to eat them, you know. But I don't try to make this tomato plant grow cucumbers. Now, I do have some cucumbers growing back there and not too sure about them. I even got some snap peas over here and I don't think they're going to make it. <laughs> you know, they don't know what they're doing. They haven't figured out if they're a snap pea, snap pea if they're a vine, if they're whining, if they're growing, if they're curling, if they're going upwards, downwards, sideways, or which way they're going. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, partly my fault. You know, I should have put them someplace else under a different kind of light. But my tomato plants, I've grown them, you know. I, I, they're growing, you know. They got little blossoms on them, you know, and they're kind of like, you know, developing, you know, and they've got their, their stems are getting out, you know, and they're kind of getting taller, you know, and growing upward, you know, and outward, and, you know, they're kind of doing their thing, and they're getting rounder, and, you know, the roots are kind of spreading, you know, on my table. <laughs> yeah, it's a table. <laughs> Nothing underneath. <laughs> Ooh, it's going to be fun. You know, but, I, you know, they're growing, you know, and I'm expecting, sooner or later, there to be tomatoes. But, you see, the only thing I have to do is I just water them. You know, water them. Kind of keep them, you know, safe from, you know, major windstorms, but for the most part, just water them. You know, maybe brush off some of the bugs, you know, when they get bugs, or, you know, maybe spray them once in a while if they do need something to be sprayed on, you know, for bugs or insects. But other than that, they grow on their own. You get the point? When they get water, and even if they didn't get water, they'd still try to grow. A plant grows no matter what. People grow, whether you know it or not. They're going to grow. God's going to grow them up. They have it in their nature, that aspect, that even if you think they're just a pew sitter, they're growing. So, a lot of times what you see happening in people's lives isn't necessarily something wrong with them or 
What's wrong with them isn't necessarily some major sin in their life, but it's God working in them, both to do and to will of His good pleasure, causing them to grow up into the stature of what He wants them to be. And it just might be a tomato plant. Now, if I see one of those people at church growing up to be a tomato plant, I'm going to come over and talk to them for a minute. And I say, I think you got the wrong idea. It's not exactly what God wants for you. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I love that little one. No, 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 no. You know, it's like my wife and I, we have these little kind of like, you know, goofy things that we do, you know. Or, okay, she's normal. I'm the goofy one. <laughs> I'll come up to her and go, no, 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 no. <laughs> Drives her crazy, you know. No, 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 no. You know, and it's kind of cute, you know. Okay, I like it. Maybe she doesn't. <laughs> Gets the point across. No, 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 no. Pretty obnoxious, isn't it? No, no. But... The reality is God doesn't do that with us. He will let you get involved sometimes in places where you should not be involved. He'll let you step your foot in it in order to realize you put your foot in it. Sometimes, even when it seems like the right thing to do, it might be the wrong thing for you to do. And the only way that you're going to know the difference sometimes is by being wrong so that God can make you right. There's always more to the Christian life than just thinking you know the right thing to do when you haven't asked God what He wants to do in every situation. That's why, for me, that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is so crucial because I may know what to say, but it may not be the right timing, the right place, or the right setting. I may know what to do in every given situation because I've been around for a while, but it may not be time to do that. So, I have to stop what I'm doing. Take a look around and see, do I really want to get involved in that? You know, first of all, do I want to? And it's like, well, who cares whether you want to or not? What's the Lord say? You know, like, oh, all right, Lord, you know, if you want me to, I'll get involved. You know, Lord, I don't know. You know, I'm kind of like the guy in Acts, you know. The guy in Acts, you know the guy in Acts, don't you? You know which guy I'm talking about? No? Oh, okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> Sneaky, all right. I get to talk more. Well, there's a guy in Acts, you know, he says, He's talking to the Lord, you know, he's kind of like going, yeah, you, you know, God, I, I don't know about this thing, you know, you're telling me to do this. Now, let me get this straight. You want me to take this guy in and take care of him for a while. Okay, yeah, I got that. I got an extra room, you know, I got a bed, you know, I can take the guy in. And you want me to, you know, keep him, you know, like safe and, you know, kind of be involved with him, right? Uh, this is the guy that, you know, he's, a, he's like kind of like, one of them. He's not one of us. So, because he's not one of us, are you sure you want me to take care of one of them? Because, I, you know, Lord, I don't want to do anything outside your will. If it's your will, God, then okay, but, you know, can we negotiate here? Are you sure you're wanting me to do this? Because, you know, I heard he kills people. You know, the guy that took in Paul, you know, and took care of Paul when he got knocked off his horse. I know a lot of pastors that, you know, in ministry that got knocked off their horse at some point in time when they thought that they were like, ooh, big Jesus. The only sad thing is, is after they got knocked off their horse, there weren't too many people in Acts that were coming along to help them out. I was one of those kinds of people that used to kind of go look around for those guys that had fallen off their horse, you know, and kind of used to talk to them for a while, you know, make sure that they weren't like losing their cookies completely, you know, and that's kind of where I'm at a lot of times with some people, you know, it's like, I may know that they're heading for a fall. It doesn't mean that I'm necessarily going to stop them from it because sometimes the fall is for what they need more than they need the standard of what I may be presenting to them or the righteous perspective they may think that I have. And the reality is I'm just compassionate to want to say, hey, you know, bro, it's just not working out that way. You're going to fall. And, you know, there aren't going to be too many you're going to want around at that time. You're going to run and hide from it, you know, and the reality is you need to kind of like just own it, you know, and move on, because God still loves you. God still cares about you. And matter of fact, I'm one of those kind of guys, and I don't care if you're in charge or if you're just a simple, humble person like me. I still love you. And you know, that's what Jesus wants from every one of us. He doesn't want us all to become pastors or all to become elders or all to become deacons. He doesn't want us all to continue on becoming bigger and better and greater, you know, at whatever it is we do. Sometimes he wants us to step back 
Sometimes he wants us to step down. He doesn't want you always to be the winner. Really, seriously. He doesn't always want you to be the guy that, you know, made the winning touchdown. You know, the guy can't make the winning touchdown unless he's got blockers in front of him. You know, somebody had to hike that ball to him, you know, and somebody had to coach him in order to get there. So, your heroes never accomplish what they do without there being a whole lot of other people that really are, in God's eyes, the men of God he wants them to be. Decreasing for his purpose. We're doing utmost, you know, as you can tell, because I'm just sitting here kind of babbling, you know, about how much, you know, we need to do something that doesn't make much sense to you until you kind of think about it, and then you go, oh, okay, I got it. Sometimes. Because, you see, maturity for men is a tough situation. We usually got to get beat up in order to grow up. Don't ask me why, but we men, we just sometimes don't get it. And I have been around a lot of men in my time. So this, the women usually catch it right away on the first first time. doesn't mean they stick with it, but it means they catch it. You know, they get, they get the point. But then they kind of like, you know, they'll move off onto some other tangents too. You know, like a whole bunch of them. You know, cooking, sewing, you know, no, I'm kidding. You know, favorite days, you know, birthdays, anniversaries. You know. Just joking, don't get mad at me, you know. I happen to, you know, enjoy women's teachings as much as I enjoy men's teachings, you know. Sometimes I enjoy the women's more. You know, I really can't. Well, anyways, it's a long story. But in decreasing for his purpose, he must increase and I must decrease. If you become a necessity to someone else's life, you are out of God's will. Think about that for a minute. Make sure you got the handle on what it says, because sometimes people who listen to these videos and they kind of they go off on tangent on one piece of it and they don't listen to the whole thing. It's kind of normal, you know. You got the attention span of a two-year-old or less. If you become a necessity to someone's life, you are out of God's will. Take that to the love affair, you know. Like if you think you can't live without somebody, wrong. If you think that you can't live without him. If you can't live without her, if you can't live without your whatever, wrong. If you become a necessity in someone else's life, you are out of God's will. As a servant, your primary responsibility is to be a friend of the bridegroom. John 3, 29. When you see a person who is close to grasping the claims of Jesus Christ, you know that your influence has been used in the right direction. And when you begin to see that person in the middle of a difficult and painful struggle, don't try to prevent it. No. But pray that its difficulty will grow ten times stronger until no power on earth or in hell could hold him away from Jesus Christ. That the necessity of the circumstantial trials and tribulations that the person is going through will force that little sucker to their knees to cry out to God alone and not you and not call the church, and not put a prayer request in, and not get a prayer chain, and not get all these other people to sympathize, when the reality might be to realize that God is their salvation. And it can be applied to, you know, the salvation that, you know, when you aren't saved, to save, but it also applies to those that are already saved, that are trying to get out of some lesson learned, some application of the Spirit of God moving in their life that they don't want to know at this time. It's a tough road. Sometimes you got to know when to say no. And I had Romaine. <laughs> I learned it pretty quick. No. <laughs> Stick a thumb in it. Go read your Bible. Did you read your Bible today? Forget it. Get out of here. I mean, I love that guy, man. He was like, oh, I loved Romaine. Man. Romaine was like right up my alley. It's like, dude, we got it. Hey, you and me, man, let's go conquer the world. You know, we'll go save everybody. <laughs> yeah, right. Dream on, buddy. <laughs> oh, boy. But knowing to say no, you got to know when to say yes. So when you know when to say yes, you got to also know how to say no. So if you don't know how to say no or yes, then you really don't have it. <laughs> and the wisdom of it is somewhere in James. Romaine, Romaine, Romaine. <laughs> That's usually the warning sign. As soon as you mention the word James, Romaine followed it. <laughs> I was like, uh oh, here we go. Count it all joy, brother. Follows diapers, trials, tribulations. Knowing that the working of faith produces patience, but let patience have perfect work. That the man of God might be fully equipped, you know, to every good work, you know. On and on and on. <laughs> that was Romaine to the T. Always in James for you and me. <laughs> 
But over and over again, we try to be the amateur providences of... We, oh, there we go. Providences is provides. Provides. We try to be the one who provides in someone's life. That's what providences is. We try to be amateur providences in someone's life. We try to be the provider in someone's life. We are indeed amateurs coming in and actually preventing God's will and saying, you know, this person should not have to experience that difficulty. We should be able to make it easier on them. You know, we should water down maybe something, you know, so it's not so tough. We should make it easier for them to, you know, get involved. We should make it, you know, a lot more fun, you know, to be in church. We should get some, you know, some really cool gimmicks and, you know, some really star power, you know, so that they'll want to come. Frankly, you know, I think the message, you know, go to hell or go to heaven, get right or get left, you know, is pretty good, you know. <laughs> Frankly, go to hell if you want to. <laughs> Sorry. Go away. You know, I like small churches. Many are called, but few are chosen. And I love it. <laughs> no, I'm not saying I want everybody else to go to hell. Can I think about it for a few? Okay, bring them in. <laughs> uh, but, instead of being friends of the bridegroom, our sympathy gets in the way. One day that person will say to us, You are a thief. You stole my desire to follow Jesus. And because of you, I lost sight of him. I was following you while you were following him. Beware of rejoicing with someone over the wrong thing, but always look to rejoice over the right thing. The friend of the bridegroom rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. I don't want in this ministry, and I've said it over and over again in Vidivo, that the only purpose we have the only reason we share devotions is not for me to get up and, you know, kind of vent my own personal relationship about God and, you know, have something wonderful to say about everything and everybody in whatever way. I don't really care, you know. It's like, no, you know, I'd just as soon be a hermit somewhere alone with God. You know, I kind of enjoy that. Bring my wife along, you know, maybe a dog or cat. But I'm kidding. I don't want a dog or cat. <laughs> no. You know, two or three kids? No, I'm kidding. One and a half? Okay. But the point is, we, what is the point? We, we get in the way because we often don't allow or get excited about someone else learning to hear God's voice. Here in Vidivo, the only thing our purpose and desire is is for you to know Jesus in a more personal and intimate way, relating to Him in such a personal way that you'll know Him in a way that you've never known before and you'll get even closer to Him than you know now that every opportunity we can, we bring it down home to the nitty gritty. We play stupid in order to make you wise. We play dumb in order for you to have something from the sun. We make every chance, every perspective, every little tomato plant that I got right over here, now I'm getting ready to eat them. <laughs> no, we use everything available to us so that we would become poor, that you might become rich, that we would be in perplexity until you become rich in the glorious knowledge of the Son of God in knowing Him so that you could hear his voice and know him in a personal intimate way <laughs> now why do I say that because the world says you can't hear him I know people today if I tell them you know hey I hear God's voice no you don't want to bet <laughs> happened <laughs> you know happened and will happen again and does happen God speaks direct at times now not everyone but you see God promised he would though Here's the key issue that I find a problem with. When I was growing up as a born-again Christian, 30 some odd years ago, God spoke to me directly the first time in a long conversation. It wasn't a small conversation either. It wasn't on drugs or anything else. Matter of fact, I was pretty puritanical in those days. I don't even think I was on Pepsi. <laughs> well, okay, maybe I had Pepsi. But I remember when God first spoke to me. I think I was maybe three years old in the Lord. Maybe four, because I've been at Calvary for a while. I've been at Calvary maybe a couple years. And when God spoke to me, when Jesus spoke to me direct, you know, audibly, you know, like, we had a conversation. We talked, you know. He said, Michael, I said, yes, it's Jesus. Uh, you know, and stopped. I was shocked because I was kind of trying to do what we used to call discernment, you know, in those days. We used to, like, sense in our spirit, 
check in the word, you know, try to regurgitate in our mind, you know, try to pull all these things together and then whisper little prayers in our mind, you know, back to God to say, God, is this Jesus or what, what's going on? What kind of deception is going on? You know, it's just like weird. And the funny thing was, Jesus knew that when he spoke to me because he said, do you believe me? I went, <gasps> and I mean, it was like inside everything just, you know, the sense of the Holy Spirit, the sense of, you know, the fullness of God, all this stuff went, shoom, and it was kind of like a real interesting experience. <laughs> I mean, it was like something I went, Ah, you know, like it could have been a long pause until I finally said, yes. And I was waiting for the punchline because even when I said yes, I think part of me was still saying no. But the point is, is that 20, so, or wherever it was, you know, so that must have been like 35 years ago, because I'm plus 35, I'm about 39 year old Christian now. But about 35 years ago, I used to think that every Christian in the world, every board, Okay, every born again Christian in the world, whether they're born again Catholic, born again Protestant, born again whatever, you know, Mennonite, Hennonite, you know, Armenian, you know, <laughs> okay, we won't go there. But whatever they were born again, I thought they all heard God speak. You know, I used to assume for probably a good 22 years after that that everybody audibly heard God speak. I, I didn't know that quite a few didn't, you know. Now I'm sure a lot of other people do, you know. I don't mean in some, you know, Pentecostal kind of weird way, you know, kind of like, you know, where you get into some kind of, thus saith the Lord, you know, thus saith the Lord, you know, and condemn somebody. No, I mean, it was a, it was a real conversation, you know, it was genuine. Jesus is that real, you know, and that personal. He, he, he knew where I was at, he knew what to say to me, and I was like, wow, man, it blew me away. And not knowing that people didn't know God in a personal way, I was shocked to find out that people had been teaching against that because they were so worried that people might go astray. And I thought, how could you go astray when you're seeking the Lord to follow Him every day? You know, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. You know, and here I am searching the Scriptures daily to find out what is the will of God so that I would be programmed in my mind in order to walk according to His will and not according to the worldly ways. And I'm always programming my mind by teaching and allowing the Word of God to dwell in me richly that I might bring up those things which God has caused me to remember whatsoever it is that the Holy Spirit causes me to remember because He'll cause me to remember the things that Jesus taught, the things Jesus said, and things that He demonstrated, and He'll give me understanding according to the spirit of wisdom, spirit of knowledge, and the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and the way that God would want me to be in order to live my life according to the will that He's chosen for me in the direction that I'm supposed to go, and in the way that I interrelate with individual people according to the Master's plan that He has for me in order to accomplish that thing which He wants me to be, whether it be a vessel of honor, a vessel of See what I mean? In other words, it was just like, you know, and to me it was like, of course you don't get deceived. Of course you're not like Joseph Smith following, you know, magic classes, you know, and going the, you know, cool route by putting on some Blu-rays, you know, or I was trying to think of those ones, band glasses, I don't know, whatever the modern ones are, I don't know. I'm not into style and, you know, you know I'm a Southern California son, but anyways, the point being is that you don't get deceived. You know, you're not misled. You know, you've got the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. The personification of the Word of God is Jesus. And Jesus, when He speaks to you, you know because He always brings out the Word of God in you and He brings it to your realization and knowledge. And it wasn't like something weird in the Jesus movement. It was pretty common with the people I dealt with. But when I found that out, I realized, oh my God, they're focused in on ministries and doing things about God without knowing God. And so I got a little nervous about being around people. You know, kind of like, okay, you know, I'd kind of go, Lord, you know, and I used to have these little private conversations, you know, I'd be very internalized about my prayer time and personal relationship until I learned to be outwardly expressive of it to other people because I was actually a pretty shy guy when I was at Calvary. <laughs> <laughs> me? Shy? Who? Me? Huh? Where? Huh? Where'd he go? There was a shy guy here somewhere. <laughs> eh, you know, <laughs> what can I say? I was shy. <laughs> Wallflower. But, because I had all these wonderful men of God around, you know, they were all so dynamic. But they didn't decrease that someone like me might increase. They increased and I decreased. And God wants us sometimes to do that in order that someone else around us would increase. So I step out of the way whenever someone comes to me out of Vidivo or some out of ministry thing, and I share with them a portion of what they may need. Not the whole counsel of God, my good golly. 
what is it that God wants to do with you? You know, what is God telling you? Whatsoever the Lord, you know, this is the motto I have for this ministry, you know, is that um, whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. I have people that disagree with me to my face, you know, regularly on the internet. You know, they'll, they'll write something and I'll say no, false, to argue with them about theology or about hermeneutic, homiletic, or the way that they're going to dispensate, you know, whatever it is that they're trying to talk about theological premises in order to, you know, kind of confuse someone or diffuse someone or sometimes deceive someone. You know, I can pretty much answer all those. Those are like, you know, right off the bat, you know, go right down the list. Pretty easy, you know, I mean, you know, you kind of, human nature in the book of Proverbs is pretty listed. <laughs> and Ecclesiastes and Job and kind of like the whole volume of the book because God is talking to us about human nature and about the way that we want us to relate to his son because the volume of the book is about his son. So we, well, anyways, the bottom line being is that all of that's easy, but letting God be personal in an intimate way to someone else, that's hard. That's like being a father to all kinds of children, you know, that are growing up and you don't have to be there on every occasion for them. You have to, like a father, learn to let go and watch and know that when they need you, they will call on you. And you know, even when they call on you sometimes, you don't need to give everything you got. You just need to give what God says to do in every search and staff situation because he's making you beyond that servant who doesn't know what his master's doing into someone like his father that Jesus said he wanted us to become one with. We begin to look at other people and we begin to release them and let them become children of God that they're meant to be with their mistakes, with their failures, with their faults, with the times they fall down and with the times that they stand up. We rejoice with them even though it may be for a season they may not look or appear as we would want them to be completely. But they come back rejoicing with the things they've learned from that experience. That's why we decrease lots of times in the ministry in order to let others increase. We take a step back. We watch from a distance. We see from afar, even as I'm doing right now in a church I'm participating in. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled that he must increase, but I must decrease. This was spoken with joy, not with sadness. As last, they were so to see the bridegroom, and that was the greatest accomplishment that John wanted for his disciples or anyone else to see. Behold, look, grasp this truth, understand it, take it inside, consider it, think about it, realize the bridegroom cometh. Follow him. This is he whom I spoke of. Listen intently with your entire being until you hear the bridegroom's voice in the life of another person and you will never be the same. saved when I married her. And uh, she's gone through some real big challenges that a human being shouldn't have to face. But <laughs> you, know, like, hey, you, you do what you do. You know, Sometimes God brings you through these circumstances to bring about His glory for His own purpose that another soul might be saved or another person might know Him in a personal way or mention the way. And so, when I married my wife, you know, no, I didn't do it the Christian way or the way that some people say. I did it in God's way. That God told me at the time what to do, and I did it. My wife knows it. And she's lived it out, you know, to see to this day now the accomplishment of what she started with to where she is today. But you know, one of the things I did with her was lived out this I must decrease, but she must increase was I knew when I married her that I had such a dominant, forceful personality and role over lots of people's lives that 
I had run into that place where when I get involved in a church, people congregate with me, you know, and they, they want to be around and talk about or do or somehow maybe even steal some of the joy, maybe, I don't know. But the point is that somehow I've always got these little, you know, kind of like a bunch of people following around or talking or whatever. And I'm, you know, it's like, okay, fine, you know, you know whatever reason, you know, the Lord's leading him, you know, if he's leading him. And sometimes that causes frustrations in some people's ministries at times, you know, and I never paid much attention to it. I said, look, if you want me to walk away, I, it's fine with me today, you know. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm, I'm with the Lord, you know. You tell me. I'm subservient unto your ministry, you know, the things that you're doing according to God leading you, you know. And I, as long as I'm in this house and as long as I'm sitting under your feet, you know, I'll do anything I can to wash your feet to see you grow in the knowledge of Jesus so that you can minister that knowledge to the rest of us and we can be blessed by what God is showing you and revealing that we would hear from his voice as he speaks to you. And I've always been that way about every pastor, whether I agree with him or not, different story. But the point is, even in disagreement, I still had that attitude and did those things on every one of them. And so, with my wife, I knew that I cast a shadow without meaning to and that I didn't want her to be living in that shadow. I wanted her to find Jesus, to know Jesus, to grow in the knowledge of Him until the day that she... Until the day my, my Father and my Lord Jesus, either one, God or God, either way I wind up with both. But the day that God would speak through her to me. And you know, when it happened a long time ago, I was so humbled, so thrilled, so rejoicing like John the Baptist that I could say with all confidence in my heart, soul, mind, and strength, Oh, I must decrease that she would increase. Oh, God, make her greater than I am in knowing you. And you know, she don't remember it. <laughs> My wife has this kind of memory that goes, you know, like, really? I did that? You know, okay, honey. You know, fine. <laughs> You're perfect for me because I remember everything. She remembers nothing. <laughs> you know, we're a great, great combination. And the joy of that is wonderful. But as I watched her grow, as she's become a testimony to me, as she's become a witness to me of Jesus, as I've seen in her things that aren't me, you know, there's some things that you can't get away from. Oh, well, osmosis, you know, she begin to look like me. Her nose is growing. No, I'm kidding. You know, there's some things that, you know, about the knowledge of God or maybe Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that some things I had to teach her, you know. <laughs> you know, I'll make it a little easier on her. But for the most part, you know, I wanted her to grow up in her own way and development and relationship with Jesus. And that's what I want for you. You see, it's never been about any of us, whether it be a Chuck Smith or Billy Graham or me or, you know, well, I don't want to put me in that category, but you know what I'm saying. You know, it's like, I'm not like those guys, you know. They're up there and I'm over here, you know, I'm out here. I'm out to lunch and they're, you know, hit, hitting the dinner table. But the point is, is that we all want for you to grow. We all want for you to know. We all want for you to hear. We all want for you to be with Jesus. We just want us, we just want to remind you that though we can't always walk with you in everyday relationship to what you're going through, we can inspire you to the place where you can grow and step forward where we can step back and let you go on with God where we might watch and see you cast a shadow, not of negativity or some shadow of you know, sinfulness or something, but a giant shadow of us looking at you and treating you as one of the men and women of God that you were meant to be. God wants you to be one of those hero, greatest heroes of the Bible. You know, with all the faults, you know. <laughs> I always gotta throw that in, you know, it's like, we already know what you got, you know. We know where you come from. Hey, hello, you know, your mom and dad, you know, hey, they're around, so we know where you come from. You know, you're not so great, Jesus. We know what kind of son you were. But the point is, what we do in ministry, what a pastor does, what a elder or deacon or any person that's 
trying to help you in some way in a church setting or even in a personal setting or a father of children, you know, and the child is rebelling. We don't really want to be in charge. We know the Lord is. We want to decrease our influence on you so that you would begin to become like these plants, these tomato plants, that no matter what, whether I water them or whether the sun comes out or the clouds or the rain or the snow or the hail, they're growing. Their nature is to grow. They're going to grow. And that's all I want for you is to grow in the knowledge of Jesus. To know Him more personal and intimate than you've ever known Him before. Because if I can step away, you know, I'd give you everything I got today. And I'd lay down and die and happy man if you'll walk with Him in a tender, emotional relationship that is clinging to Him and hearing His voice. And I mean audibly. And I mean realistically. And I mean reality every day. That you're clinging to Him and not following any other man. You know, when I know that, I'm one happy sinner saved by grace.